dear people of God who are saved only by God's grace through the faith that can only come from only his word. Amen. King Darius of the Persian Empire and his buddies, the Medes, pretty much like toppled overnight the Babylonian Empire. And King Darius' very first act as emperor of a brand new empire was to install 120 satraps or governors over the whole entire territory with three more top administrators over them said he could do kingly stuff and not have to do any actual government stuff. You'd think brand new Persian empire, brand new Persian government with brand new Persian officials doing that government stuff. That makes sense. But then... There's this Daniel guy that we read about, Daniel, the Israelite, who was one of the top three administrators over those 120 satraps and whom Darius had in mind to put as the number one over the top of his whole entire new empire. Daniel. This is Daniel. Daniel, the same guy who did the very same work in the previous government, was now given a position of incredibly high honor and authority in the new one, which doesn't usually happen. Daniel was extremely capable and must have won immediate respect and admiration from everybody that he worked with because he survived a regime change, which by most estimates is is a success, a, a good thing. Unless, of course... Daniel is your competition or your boss. And he's just too good at his job, so you're not gonna move up the company ladder, so to speak. And this doesn't sit well with you, so what do you do? We gotta get rid of Daniel. Gotta get rid of Daniel. And that's exactly what happened. A a contingent of these satraps decided they should dig up some dirt on Daniel. But given his unimpeachable character, they couldn't find any dirt on which about Daniel about what Daniel to dig up and so they tried plan B which is to exploit Daniel's practice of his faith so they hurried up and had King Darius pass a, an ego inflating law that anybody and everybody who's going to be praying should pray to King Darius alone for the next 30 days and if it's found out that they pray to any god or human other than Darius that person is to be thrown in a den full of ravenously hungry lions that's how things stood Now, Daniel, when he learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. When worship of God becomes formally illegal, the very first thing Daniel does is go home and worship his God and pour his heart out to him in very meaningful, earnest prayer. And the first thing that we read about that Daniel does in prayer is give God thanks, which would have been very hard to do in the situation, but that's exactly what he did. He asked God for help and for guidance, just like he had done before every other day, right up until that one, and just like he had done before every other day, right up until that one, he did it without shame. His windows, which opened toward the west facing Jerusalem, were flung wide open and three times a day, Daniel got down on his knees and prayed to his savior God just as he had done before and predictably orchestrated, Daniel was caught red-handed. These men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. If we're going to do some reforming this Reformation Day, 
What a wonderful and very timely reformer we find in Daniel, the wise man, advisor, prophet who lived like thousands of years before we do. Let's be like Daniel, who with full knowledge of the injustice against him and who with full knowledge of the unjust severity of the penalty abided it all without losing his cool. He doesn't lash out in rage and anger at the schemers or King Darius. He he doesn't uh, file a countersuit in the court system. Instead, what he does is just fervently praise to God. Let's pray rather than lashing out defensively or being the first in line to usually angrily announce, should something like this happen to us, that that injustice is happening against me because of my faith, almost as though Jesus never said it was going to happen. Daniel's a rather extreme example. But in faith, and because of his faith, He took a death sentence on the chin, mindful of his home in heaven. Certainly, we can let slights, both those we make up and fabricate, which we do a lot, and we're good at that, and the actual ones, which are legitimate hurts, Legitimate pains, real burdens and crosses to bear, but are also things which we, in our place, in our time, in our circumstance, dare never elevate to a a Daniel-esque level of persecution or suffering because that would be insincere, wouldn't it? That wouldn't be honest. And that would be disrespectful to those brothers and sisters who are not necessarily here. And and I am open to new information as well. Don't get me wrong. But our brothers and sisters in the Lord who are paying a much higher price for their faith, we haven't come yet to the point of shedding blood in our contention for it. This perspective is valuable because it can help enable us to let those slights roll off our backs as we continue to carry on in love and in joy. We can do that, right? Yes, absolutely we can. We, we have Jesus, of course we can do that. We can be a whole bunch of Daniels who when hate and anger or injustice and scheming, whatever it is, happens against us because of our faith, we can meet that hate and that ill treatment with love and grace. And if and when we do, I guarantee you that the results are better every single time. When you are hated, don't reply with anger. Instead, say, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace and and say that out loud to somebody and see what happens. And then in your mind, continue to petition the merciful Lord God on that person's behalf that whatever their burdens are, that God would lift them away and, and remove them far away. That whatever is hurting that person, God would cause it to just stop. That God would just bless that person tremendously and then continue praying for yourself after you've prayed for others. That God would show you mercy too because you know how much you need it. That you would always be found in God's favor. Let's do that. Let's be like Daniel who broke the law because he knew his Lord, and that was okay. But when it was reported, 
that Daniel had broken the law. Darius did everything in his power that he could to try and change Daniel's situation, knowing that he really couldn't do all that much without completely undermining himself. So as Daniel is being thrown into the lion's den to show where his heart's at and in concern for Daniel, he shouts out, may the God you serve night and day, Daniel, save you right now. And then a stone was placed uh, over the, the entrance, whatever their setup was, and the, the signet ring of the king and all the other nobles were pressed in probably to wax or something so that the stone couldn't be moved and Daniel's situation could not be changed. And that didn't sit well with Darius, who had great concern for Daniel. Darius, who called off the expected uh, royal entertainment, uh, didn't do any uh, kingdom work or statecraft that night, uh, didn't even eat food, didn't even sleep. He couldn't. He was too stressed out about Daniel. I don't imagine it was a night spent easily in dreamland for Daniel either. Darkness and knowing that it's filled uh, with hungry lions at deadly close proximity to you probably took care of that. But I also don't imagine that during the course of that evening, which probably felt like an eternity to Daniel, I don't imagine that he stopped praying for a single instant to his God. What do you think he said? What kind of prayers did he offer some of the tried and true tested? Did he, did he run through the passages that he had learned as a younger man or a boy, passages like this that had been around for a while at this point. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. And maybe as he thought he could meet his maker anytime, he thought about who he was and his sins. So he prayed this prayer too. Maybe the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. And before those prayers left Daniel's lips, the Lord God was hearing them and was listening. He was with Daniel. He was with Darius too. Darius who didn't sleep a wink and who at the absolute first opportunity he could broke social decorum again and ran to the tomb and in anguish, not expecting Daniel to be alive, shouted out for Daniel's attention to check on him according to the way that he most closely associated Daniel. He said, Daniel, Servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And I don't imagine that Darius expected to hear a reply, but Daniel shouted out from within the den of lions, your majesty, you're awesome. Thank you for asking about how I'm doing. Live forever. My God did better than you could possibly have imagined he would. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. Can you imagine that time? That, that exact moment for Daniel. How wild, how surreal, right? To, to, to know that you had an extended scrape with death and now here you are out of that dark pit in the light and and he's looking himself over and he can't he can't even find a scratch on him that had to have been just the the most wild experience of all time and it did a couple of excellent things for Daniel it confirmed for him in a very meaningful and visceral way that God was absolutely for him and it also let Daniel know beyond any shadow of a doubt, that he was innocent. Not just in respect to that particular matter, but innocent in general, that he was righteous because he believed in God. Daniel coming out of there without a scratch on him. It's the last thing anybody expected, but that's exactly what happened because he trusted in God and was found innocent. It's the exact same thing with you. 
you come out of this life unscathed. That's your hope. That's your truth because Jesus, the healing balm, makes all the wounded, all of us, entirely whole. He heals our sin-sick souls. So imagine, if you will, for a little bit that time that God has already determined when he chooses to bring you out of the dark and bleary ordeal, the time of being in the pit of this life into just the, the light of his peace. And what a surreal time that will be when it, it's gonna feel, maybe, I don't know what it's gonna be like, but maybe it'll feel too good to be true for a little bit. So you're checking things out, realizing that no, this is absolutely real and it's absolutely mine. And, and maybe, there, who knows, there's a vestige of, of memory lingering and you thought, you know, you sure you were mortally wounded or something. And you're checking yourself over for scrapes and marks and you don't have a single mark on you and you don't have a single hurt in your heart either. And as you continue surveying things, you, you look around and then you make, you make eye contact with a lamb that looks like it had been slain and you understand like you never have before how much God is for you. You understand truly and deeply what it means that by his wounds, by Jesus' wounds, the son of God's wounds, his death on the cross wounds, that you are healed. And, and you'll know and you'll understand it very deeply, very truly the love of God that started that saving work and the love of God that saw it all the way through to the very end. And you'll smile as you look at him. How can you not when you look at your Savior, Jesus? You don't have to wait for any of that, though, do you? All of that, we just talked about it, it's, it's yours right now. So let's live like it is. We have the peace of Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit's power to imitate Daniel's way of being when called to account for his faith or just when suffering for it and to echo these excellent words of praise from King Darius who said, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. God has saved you. Probably not from a lion unless you have a really interesting story to tell, in which case, please find me right after church and let me know all about it. I'm guessing that hasn't happened though, right? No, but you know that God has absolutely saved you. And from what? From, from yourself. God has saved us from ourselves, from our sinful natures with their wide open jaws and their insatiable appetites. Jesus has saved you from all of your sins and in doing so silenced the roaring of your enemy, the devil who prowls around like a lion looking to devour you, but who cowers very much defeated before the Lord Jesus. That's why he came here, you know, the Lord Jesus, it, it was for you. It was to find you when you were lost, to save you when you were dead in sins, to deliver you when you were trapped in darkness and to destroy the work of the devil, which is to accuse you. The devil can't do that anymore, can he? There's nothing to accuse you of because Jesus has taken your sin away and muzzled the devil and wrapped him in chains and hurled him into the abyss. Satan is defeated. You are innocent. You will rise. Therefore, 
There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If God is for us, who can be against us? You have found favor with God. You have been made righteous through faith in Jesus. And this wasn't from yourself. It's a gift of God purely by grace. You have God's mercy. And you have just so much of it more than you're usually aware that you have. So when your conscience comes roaring condemnation at you, just go ahead and remember that and watch it quiet on down. Jesus himself gently speaks right to you, tenderly to your heart, that your sin is forgiven, that your faith has saved you, that you are innocent in God's sight. That's how you stand, able to take whatever on the chin because you know who God is, that he's for you and what he's done for you, that he is your strength, your song, he's your salvation. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. We hope that God's word has strengthened your faith. To help us know more about the reach of our efforts here at Manav, we hope that you'll like and subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook pages, and that you also sign our online friendship register to let us know that you're listening today. God bless and keep you.